is Tuesday. What is the date? 26th of March, year of our Lord, 2024. And I am getting a late start. Welcome to Personal Finance at the University of Houston. I am going to jump into the Zoom room <clears throat> and let some folks be admitted, if I can do that. Welcome, welcome if you're in the Zoom room. I'm sorry to keep you waiting. Uh, hopefully you can hear me. If you could, please give me a little chat. Let me know you can hear me. I got a little, had a little technical difficulty uh, this morning. So I apologize for the delay. We are going to talk about tax advantaged investing in this lecture. Uh, so Gavin, good morning. Can you hear me okay? Oh, can hear me okay. I see your chat. Thank you very much. I appreciate that as always. So I'm going to get started here with a couple of uh, little review maybe. Let me see. You can see my screen okay. Hopefully that looks okay. Is it blurry, by the way, uh, Gavin? I've had a little trouble. It's like when this live streams, and by the way, by the way, we are live streaming to Facebook and YouTube. So if you're watching on YouTube, don't forget to hit the little like button. Uh, and if you are watching on Facebook, I guess you hit the like button there too. But anyway, this is a live stream. So welcome if you're in the live stream. Um, not blurry. Good. So what I've found over this semester anyway is somehow there's a setting in uh, there's a setting in Zoom. And if I don't have that setting right, then even though the live stream comes in crystal clear, what you see in the Zoom room is not always great. So I'm glad to hear that looks good. So, um, hey, if you got any questions, we have a very small number of students here in the Zoom room, and I'm assuming I know everyone's watching uh, on the in the playlist, and I appreciate that. I appreciate that uh, you guys watch in the playlist because <clears throat> um, I know you watch because you're doing a great job keeping up with the secret class collaboration component of your assignments each each week so that's awesome um, and I think what I want to make sure of real quick I'm going to jump in and check something real quick uh, yep okay good <clears throat> just checked my microphone to make sure I'm on the right microphone so cool um, so let me get in here and I want to uh, review a couple of things um, first of all before we get into this this uh, this lecture this assignment this lesson which is tax allocation so the title is really tax Ad advantaged investing which is the second law of personal finance the first law let me see if I can pull up the laws of personal finance. So the three laws of personal finance. Uh, the first law is the law of tax. It, the first law is the law of spending and saving. Spend less than you earn so that you can save more for what matters most. That's the first law of personal finance. Uh, looks like my video's stuck, playing slow. Um, and the second law of personal finance, <laughs> which is coming up on the screen here in just a second, uh, is the law of tax advantage investing. And that's what we're going to talk about today. I'm going to review a couple of things to help you put that into context. What is tax advantage investing and how does it show up in your financial plan? And the way that it shows up in your financial plan is through tax allocation. And that's going to be your homework assignment this week is to allocate your accounts so that you have the proper tax allocation. So we're going to talk about that. The third law of personal finance is, to me, the most important one. It's the law of purpose and commitment. I was um, had a conversation yesterday with one of my, well, he's probably the most important uh, career coach in my career. 
just based on the amount of time we've spent together and the, the, the value of our relationship. His name is Doug Carter. So, Doug, if you happen to be listening, here's a little love for you, Doug Carter. Doug is he's a friend. He's a treasured resource. But anyway, we're having a conversation. We're about to have a, a big uh, group meeting. We get together twice a year. We call it the summit. Uh, and it's a bunch of financial advisors who come together and we try to help one another grow personally, professionally. We share best practices. So anyway, he asked me to to make a presentation on best practices as a financial planner. And so I thought for a minute, it was just a phone call. So it was kind of on the spot. And I was trying to think, okay, I've got an idea. Uh, I think could be valuable for our group. And it is, it came from my residency program back in um, the early days when I became a certified financial planner. But um, the, the, the program that I went to, I learned a lot of things. And uh, anyway, I, oh, <laughs> I was going to, I, I kind of forgot what I was telling, the story I was telling you about Doug Carter and the, the whole point of the best practice that I'm going to share with the group is really designed to help people, clients. You know, when I meet with a client for the first time, I ask a certain number of questions. And you guys answered one of those questions. What's your first memories of money? And that's a question that I shared with Doug that I it's hands down my favorite question because I've asked that question thousand, at least a thousand times and it's never failed to create a kind of emotional connection with folks. So the younger you are, the less impactful it is. But when you get to be my age and then somebody asks you with your spouse, what are your first memories of money? And you start to share that. It takes you way back to when you were a kid and it's just a tremendous question. But the purpose of that question, along with the next question, which is what's important about money to you? That's a question that I ask. And the and I was sharing with Doug, the reason that question is so important and so valuable is because I tell people when I ask that question, if you can help me understand your vision and your values and what matters most to you as a financial planner, that gives me so much more ability to help you create a financial plan that can get you from where you are to where you really want to be in your life. So the title of my first book was What Matters Most. And so the third law of personal finance, the law of purpose and commitment to me is the most important one. And that question or that series of questions that I ask new clients is designed to help clarify and, and sometimes just unpack because it's a conversation. What's What matters most to you? And when you know that, when you know what matters most, when you're very clear about your life's purpose and your mission, uh, it's a whole lot easier than to create a plan with steps and actionable items that make a lot of sense that give you motivation to actually do those things. And in financial planning, that is really a tricky piece of business. And so that's, um, that's why the third law of personal finance is such an important piece of this puzzle. So that is um, an important law of personal finance. But the second law of personal finance is very important, too. It's the law of tax advantage investing. We spent a lot of time this semester talking about the law of spending and saving, and I've helped you uh, understand kind of the importance of having a budget and not being buried in debt and way to use different debt strategies to get rid of debt with the hope uh, that you will decide you want to be debt free as soon as possible. Um, <clears throat> so those three laws of personal finance are kind of the framework for this course. And today, as we talk about tax allocation, we're talking about tax advantaged investing. So before I jump right into that, let me get rid of the three laws of personal finance. And I think what I want to do is just do a review of these. Um, these are the 
I call them free tick in my book, Make Your Money Count, and in my book, What Matters Most. Those are two books that I wrote early, earlier in my career, and they were basically how-to books, how to create a compelling financial plan. And in the books, I use this free tick to uh, the, the idea of free tick to um, illustrate the process of financial planning. So if you look at the screen, you can see that um, each of these, I'm going to get rid of these one at a time and just do one at a time. So financial independence is really retirement planning. And that's, to me, the most, like, everyone I ask, the, when I ask the question, what's important about money to you, if you ask my wife that question, she would say security. And she appreciates security, stability, having a plan, um, certainty. She likes certainty. But if you ask me the question, what's important about money to you, my answer would be very, very different. My answer would be having options. And so that first question, what's important about money to you, uh, how you answer that question kind of helps set the table for how we build your financial plan. But in my opinion, you know, because of my schema, because of my value system, because of what matters most to me, financial independence is a much better term than retirement. Retirement means you get old, you get to the place where you just give, you know, you stop working, you stop doing anything that adds value, you know. I mean, that's how I view retirement. So I don't ever want to retire, but I definitely have for all my life wanted to have financial independence. And so in terms of technically doing a financial plan, either of those will work. Retirement planning is the traditional name for uh, a very, very important element of financial planning. Personal finance involves seven elements. Retirement planning is one of them. Risk management is the other. Uh, estate planning, that's how you tell your assets where they're going to go after you die so that the people you love get to benefit from the work that you've done and the accumulation you've done in terms of assets. And that's a very important part of uh, financial planning. So free tick, the E, F is financial independence, R is risk management. And that means risk management, by the way, is... Uh, it's insurance planning. So I told you guys when we studied insurance, when we spent a week talking about, you know, six months worth of content, I told you if there was one area of expertise in my professional life, it would be insurance. And so insurance is um, kind of an important part of financial planning, of personal finance. It's the second part of uh, the free tick. So free tick is financial independence, risk management, estate planning, and then we have education planning. And this is just a, a, a section of financial planning that deals with one of the elements, one of the essential elements of personal finance is how are you going to fund the education for the people in your life that you love and care about and want to see have the best life possible education. Investing in education is, is a very important part of that. So there's a whole like level of financial planning related to that. It's not really one of my specialties. I work with some other folks who just specialize in education planning. It's somewhat complicated. It's always changing. But I do have some very important ideas related to education planning. But that's really kind of beyond the scope of this course. But it is part of the free tick framework. Uh, and I wanted to just kind of highlight that. The next one in free tick is tax planning. So one of the seven essential elements of personal finance is tax planning, which brings us to today's lesson, which is uh, tax advantage investing. And so that's an important, I just wanted to kind of put this in context for you again before we jump into it. And what do you think the I stands for in free tick? You can leave a comment below and tell me, what do you think, if you're listening to this and you're not paying attention to the screen, you're not seeing what is on the screen right now. Uh, but investment planning is a big part of uh, personal finance. It's actually the most popular uh, 
topic in this course is investment management. So I'm going to review a little bit in a minute the four investment strategies that we covered in this course. But the last one is cash flow management. That's really budgeting. And it's integral, integral. It's a, it's a very important part of every uh, financial plan. And it's because you have to have you have to have cash flow as part of every goal, every piece of your financial plan. So when you jump into right capital and you look at your financial plan, there's always more information that you can go and look deeper. That's what I do when you send me a question and say, what's wrong with my plan? I go right to your cash flow section and I look to see it, it tells the story of your financial plan. Where is your money going? What, wh Where are the outflows? Where are the inflows? That's cash flow management. So that is a free tick. I just wanted to share that with you. And um, I'm going to get rid of that. Oh, there's free tick. How did I get free tick up there? Oh, I put free tick up there. That's free tick. So that <laughs> Taylor, who did the illustrations for my books, I told him, I wanted to illustrate this idea of free tick. So this, if Taylor, if you're watching, I doubt that he's watching, but he is a friend of mine on Facebook, and this is being posted to Facebook. So uh, anyway, Taylor drew some really cool illustrations, um, and that was one of them. So let me just show you a couple other. This is one of the assignments you're going to do is the Blueprint for Financial Success, which is a... The metaphor that I use in all my books is a blueprint because I think that a financial plan is like building something and my job is to be an architect to help you share your vision of what you want to build and then I create a blueprint that involves a foundation which is what matters most to you, your vision, your values, your, you know, what matters most to you. That's the foundation. And then the next step is to kind of just fill in the, the framework like doing, I call it a fearless inventory of your income, your expenses, um, your accounts, all of that goes into the blueprint. Um, and then the last part of the blueprint, there's three sections. And the third section is your specific goals. And unless you have specific goals, you don't really have a financial plan. So I call that the, uh, I call that the blueprint for financial success. So um, I hope that the blueprint is an idea, a concept that you can use to put into context what we're doing in this course. So let me get back here and get the blueprint off the screen. Just let me share a couple of cool. These are all illustrations that my my friend Tyler or Taylor did. This is this one illustrates the fact that I told you if you ask my wife what what's it, what matters most to you, what's important about money to you, her first answer would be security. She values security. So the lady on the right side there would be uh, kind of an illustration of my wife, and the dude on the left would be more like me. I know he's much better looking than me, but that is just it is what it is. So that's just another illustration. And then when we talk about investment strategies, one of them is diversification. And this is an illustration of two elevators, a story I've told a thousand times about um, about the difference between the elevator on the left would be if you invested in an individual company stock like Enron. And if something terrible happened at Enron, uh, that elevator could come crashing down and you don't want to be in that elevator. So the other elevator, the one with all those cables, uh, represents diversification. And back in the day when I started in the business as an investment advisor, mutual funds were a pretty good idea. They were probably the best idea uh, because you had a manager who whose job was to check those cables and make sure that all of those companies were in solid, good shape. And when those companies were shaky, whether they had bad management or bad projections for revenue, I have a phone call coming in and it's distracting me. Let me see if I can stop it. Oh, I think I did. Uh, so 
the manager, the mutual fund manager, would would go out and select all these companies to be in the fund. And that was their job. And their job was to remove the cables that were starting to fray and put a different company in its place. So that's what um, <laughs> my wife's sending me a message now asking me to bring a screwdriver. Sorry about that. It's all popping up on my screen. So anyway, this is another illustration. It illustrates diversification. Now today, if you didn't know, I don't recommend mutual funds because there's something way superior to mutual funds. It's called an exchange traded fund. So that's what I like. My favorite investment of all time, just FYI, is SPY, SPY. It's an exchange traded fund an ETF that represents the S&P 500 which we're going to talk about in just a minute so let me just show you one more oh I'm going to show you a couple more um, let's see that's the elevators I'm going to show you this one because in all of my books I say I'm a recovering sales addict and this woman represents how it feels to work for a company like State Farm where you are basically always being pushed to sell stuff. And I also worked on Wall Street at Morgan Stanley, and I was in a three-year really cool training program where I learned a ton while I worked on Wall Street. And But the problem was you're under all these goals. They're production goals, nothing but production goals. So that is how it works in this business. Now I'm an independent fiduciary advisor. I don't have to sell anything. I just give advice. People pay me for that. It's a much better gig. But that's Sergeant Sales Lady, another illustration. I thought it'd just be fun to share some illustrations. This is Farmer Joe. Farmer Joe is uh, the way, this is the, the illustration I use to teach one of the investment strategies, which is dollar cost averaging. And this is my notes. You should have already consumed that story uh, through Money Study Group, but that's, again, just, uh, that is just some illustrations. Okay, let's see, what is this? Farmer Joe's Cows. Oh, yeah, this is, a, this is just a little video I did to illustrate Farmer Joe's Cows. So that should have been part of that other previous um, lecture okay back to work back to work back to work okay so let's see what's next I've got a little list here I didn't want to forget to kind of go over everything in review so this week's assignment is really very simple by the way um, and it's it's tax allocation so before I forget and nobody's reminded me but let me just talk about let me just talk about this week's class collaboration, the secret class collaboration. Um, let me change a couple of things here. And there we go. So I want you to think about, again, my thinking man, who I really like to put on the screen because it just seems cool to have a dude show up and do the thinking for me. But I want you to do some thinking this week and what I want you to think about is uh, I want you to think about tax allocation and I want you to just kind of tell me what it is how it works why it matters uh, and you're gonna learn about it when you do your uh, your assignment this week so I'm going to uh, do a quick presentation here in a minute um, and I'm going to share with you some buckets. I have some buckets here that I'm going to share to illustrate different types of accounts. Because when we talk about tax allocation, we're talking about types of accounts. So tax-advantaged investing is all about investing in certain types of accounts. So that's this week's class collaboration. I want to make sure you understand what the idea, the big idea of this lesson and this assignment really, is tax allocation. It's something that's going to happen in your financial plan when you do what you're going to be required to do this week in your assignment in Canvas and really in Right Capital when you update your financial plan. So I've talked to you a little bit before about 
your 401k. So let me see if I can find your 401k. Uh, I'm looking for the perfect investment. But first, I need to get rid of, hold on, let me get rid of this. And that should go away now. It did. And now what I'm going to do is I want to just talk to you about the perfect investment. Hopefully that's there. Yep. Cool. We've talked about this a couple of times. I try to talk about the perfect investment at least three times a semester because it's an important part of personal finance. The perfect investment is uh, a 401k. And you should already know about this. You, you know, we've covered it already, but in case you missed it or in case you need a reminder, I want to remind you that the perfect investment, the 401k, is a hugely important piece of the puzzle in your financial plan. And I don't just mean in your capstone assignment. It is important in your capstone assignment. But it's really important in your life. It's like one of the most important things, one of the most common mistakes people make is not taking advantage of the perfect investment. And I know there is no such thing as a perfect investment, but there certainly is something that I consider to be a perfect investment because it's the only investment I know of where you get 100% return on your investment like in the first year, every year. Uh, as long as you have a company match. So your job, when you graduate and you get a job, you get the real job that we're pretending you have now, your first job day one with HR is to sign up for all the benefits that you're going to get. And one of them is the 401k plan. The question is, are you going to sign up? Are you going to participate? The answer is yes. But then you have to know, okay, how much are you going to contribute to your 401k? So what I want you to do is to just know before you take the job, what do they, what do they match? Because that's going to be the magic number for you at minimum. You want to contribute to your 401k however much you get a match for. So for example, let's pretend you're making 100 grand, 100,000, keep the number simple, and let's pretend that your company matches 8%. What is it you need to contribute in order to get that full 8%? And what is 8% of 100,000? You can leave that in the comments if you want, but it's eight grand. So if you make 100 grand and you want to contribute to your 401k and you want to get the full match of 8%, you have to contribute eight grand. And then the company will match that 8,000, which means at the end of the year, you have a grand total of $16,000 in your 401k. Now, if you follow the baby steps, Dave Ramsey's baby steps, one of them is to invest 15% for retirement. So this is kind of a, a hack, a retirement hack, if you will. By doing this, if you have access to a 401k with matching funds, you can get to that 15% pretty quick. Now, most companies don't give you an 8% match. That's pretty optimistic. But if they did, then boom, you got 15, you got 16% right there. Because you put eight grand in, the company puts eight grand, that's $16,000, which is 16% of 100 grand. That is tax deductible. So that means what you contribute, you get to deduct from your income taxes. It's pretty awesome. So that's one of the buckets we're going to talk about. In fact, it's this big brown bucket right here. And I'm going to talk about that in just a minute. But I wanted to, again, review the perfect investment um, because that's a powerful part of your financial future. Um, because you get that match. So you get tax deferred growth and you're going to study about this this week as you learn about types of accounts and how they work. What are the rules, boundaries and limitations for something like a 401k, a Roth IRA. Um, and when I say 401k, that's the corporate plan. That's the big dog. But if you work for the government, it's like a 457 plan. If you work for a nonprofit or a church or a school, then it's a 403B. But all three of those, remember, those, those numbers are just the, the paragraph number in the IRS code. 
So 401k is a paragraph in the code, the IRS code, but it is also a type of account. It is not an investment, okay? A 401k, an IRA, a Roth IRA, these are not investments. These are types of accounts. And so when we talk about tax-advantaged investing, we're talking about types of accounts, when we talk about uh, making sure that your financial plan has the proper tax allocation, what we're talking about is investing into types of accounts that give you the benefits of tax-advantaged investing. And so the 401k is the big dog. It's the best one. It's the perfect investment. And that's why I wanted to uh, mention it. So I'm going to get that off the screen if I can. Ah, it worked. And then I want to talk about, just in review, these uh, different investment strategies. So let me get this out of the way. I think I'm live streaming. Get that out of there. So these are the four investment strategies that we've talked about that you should understand. And by the way, whether you're in this course, personal finance, or you're just thinking about uh, having a plan for investing, remember investing in the free tick model, investment management, investment planning, is a huge part of personal finance. These four strategies, in my opinion, are the most important, most powerful, most easy to access strategies, especially for younger people with a long time horizon. Investment, these investment strategies are really powerful. So diversification, the story that I tell in diversification is um, the story of Enron. And so I've already told that story a few times. I'm not going to repeat it today, but that's one of the investment strategies. The most important invest, the most important determinant of your portfolio's returns, though, it is asset allocation. And asset allocation requires you to understand uh, different asset classes. So I think I have, I'm going to do this for a minute. I'm going to get rid of that if I can. And I'm going to show some investment classes. Hopefully that works. Yes. Yeah, so these are investment classes. And you did some work in your financial plan with asset allocation. And this is what it is. It's very simple. Um, you've got four investment strategies, which I'll highlight again in just a second. But you can't really use those strategies if you're clueless about what is an asset class. So you should have learned that if you were paying attention. There was a test, a quiz. And it's really just, look, my intention is not to make you an expert investor. But I do want to set the table, build the foundation in invite you to start learning about key concepts and principles in investing. And asset classes, it's like the bedrock. You can't appreciate the benefit and the power of asset allocation if you don't understand asset classes or asset types. So there they are on the screen. Uh, they're important and you should start to understand them. And you've already been doing some work in your financial plan with asset allocation. So this week we're talking about tax allocation, but I'm just doing some review to try to make that uh, helpful. So let me get rid of that. I'm going to go back here for investment strategies. Let me just run through these real quick. If they'll be so kind as to pop up on my screen, which they did. There they are again. So asset allocation, the number one most important determinant of your portfolio's returns. If you get asset allocation right, it's just things are going to work over the long term. And the cool thing about asset allocation is when you do that, you don't even have to think about diversification because if you do proper asset allocation, you will automatically be well diversified. Diversification is just like a big warning sign, like don't have too much of your portfolio in one investment. Let me just tell you a quick story about how this would work in terms of, let's say you were, you had a, a $2 million IRA account, and let's say I managed it for you. Well, when I manage that portfolio, I'm going to have a whole lot of different holdings. One of the things I like to do is called a structured note. It's kind of like a bond, but it has some risk. And these structured notes are attached, they're linked to 
company stocks like Tesla. I have a lot of money in this note for Tesla. It pays like 18% every year. It pays out 18%. The problem is if Tesla drops uh, 40%, that note doesn't pay. And in fact, if it's like a five-year note, which means in five years it goes away and you get your money back, it's a five-year note on Tesla that pays 18%. But if Tesla drops below, you know, if it drops 40% of the original value when we put that note in place, then you don't get your coupon. You don't get your 18%, which is a big bummer, which means... If you have money invested with me, you probably don't want to go buy more Tesla because you already have exposure to Tesla. And that's diversification. That's where that kind of comes in. You want to know what kind of concentration. It might be a better word, diversification and concentration. Because whether you know it or not right now, you have a lot of exposure to NVIDIA. If you own SPY, if you own QQQ, if you own any mutual fund, any index fund that is part of the, you know, market, NVIDIA is like a redonkulous percentage of the market right now today. Tesla used to be, but Tesla's had a nasty pullback. So all that to say, these investment strategies are important and they matter. And asset allocation is the key one. Next is dollar cost averaging, which in my opinion is hands down the most powerful investment strategy for a young person. And that's where we talked about Farmer Joe. And you still, again, you have to understand asset classes to appreciate how these strategies work. So I'm hoping that while you're not an expert now, and I don't expect you to be, I hope you will at least let the seed get planted in your mind about these terms, these principles, these strategies, so that moving forward, you'll just start to absorb more and more and more, because these are the fundamentals. These are the basics. These are the things that matter. These are the strategies that will make you wealthy whether you're starting out or in the middle of your investing career or even at my age, these strategies really matter. The fourth one is portfolio rebalancing. And it just like takes your whole portfolio and puts it back in to balance the way that you originally wanted it. Or maybe you want to change your your asset allocation and then rebalance to that new allocation. Portfolio rebalancing takes your entire portfolio and allocates it the way you want it to be done. It's like pushing a button and having your whole portfolio rebalanced so that when you have these like NVIDIA in your portfolio and it's way up here and bonds, which are way down here, and you know over time you want to continue to invest in these other asset classes that have gotten hammered, what you want to do is sell high and buy low, and portfolio rebalancing is simply a systematic way to buy low and sell high, and you do it on a regular systematic basis, and over time, especially in your 401k, over time, it's like doing dollar cost averaging every time you hit that button. So just, again, I don't expect you to master these strategies today. I just want you to be familiar with them, aware of them, and I want you to be able to understand kind of how they work. So that's that's that. So let me get that out of the way. And I am going to jump into... Uh, let's see. Let's talk a little bit more about tax allocation. It's not only this week's secret collaboration, but it's also uh, the lesson. So tax allocation, I'm going to leave that up there. Um, you're going to learn about different types of accounts. The first type of account, I use this big plastic bucket to illustrate because this is, it's a plastic bucket. And it has no special purpose, no special protection, but it's big. It's the biggest of all the buckets. So you can own stuff and it can be in this bucket and you get no tax benefit. So the blue bucket, the big blue bucket is like your brokerage account. You can have a brokerage account where you invest unlimited amounts of money in, in stocks like NVIDIA or Apple or Tesla or whatever. 
And when you sell those stocks in this blue bucket, what happens is you have to pay tax on the growth. Trust me, that can eat away your profit pretty quick. So the big blue bucket is unlimited. You can put all anything in it. And then when you sell it, you pay taxes on the growth. So that's the big blue bucket. It's important to know the big blue bucket. The next one is the one I consider the 401k. It's a big bucket. It's the biggest tax advantage bucket you're ever going to have. And this bucket represents uh, tax deductible and tax deferred. So tax deductible is like your 401k and you, you put money into this big bucket, whether it's a 401k, 403b, 457. Again, you're going to learn your job this week is to understand this big brown bucket. I, it represents the 401k. So that's that. So let me see if I can. I think I made up. Let's see what happens when I use this camera. Yeah, there we go. So I'll use both cameras. That's the brown bucket. The big metal bucket, it's 401k. And when you leave a job, by the way, let's say you got that job that you really wanted and you worked there for three years, four years. My phone's ringing again, sorry. Anyway, when you leave that job, that 401k is terminated. So then you take your 401k out of the big brown bucket and you roll it over into a tax deductible IRA. So this is an IRA. This bucket is the IRA. It's the same as the big brown bucket except it's quite much it's quite a bit smaller. But it's where you roll over your funds and they have the same basic rules, boundaries and limitations. So if you're a teacher and you leave that school and you go to a different school, you set up a new 403B and you take your old 403B and you roll it over into an IRA account. If you leave a company, uh, you take that, 40, that 401k because you left that company and you put it into your, um, that's pretty weird. You can see through my bucket. The reason is because it's got some green on it. It looks blue. Over, well, no, that's so weird. <laughs> yeah, I'm using a green screen. Sorry, I have too much fun sometimes. So back to the 401k, you roll that over into an IRA. You're going to learn about an IRA, a tax deductible IRA. It's tax deductible, just like your 401k. It's an IRA, which means technically it's an individual retirement arrangement. But we all call it an individual retirement account, an IRA, tax deductible, traditional tax deductible IRA. That's what this bucket represents. And inside this bucket, not as big as the brown bucket, but it's a pretty big bucket, and it can be pretty much unlimited. This is what I think of. It's a gold bucket, and this is an, a Roth IRA. This is the only tax-free investment I know of. And inside of it would be the investments that you have. So you can remember I told you with the big blue bucket, if you invest, say you invested in Apple stock back in, say 2009 apple stock was trading at 125 bucks a share so uh, in money study group i give you a pretty cool illustration about apple stock if you would have owned apple stock if you would have bought a hundred thousand dollars worth of apple stock back in 2009 in this account in this big blue account if you would have done that and then you would have sold it Let's not say today because Apple is down quite a bit. But if you would have sold it at its high, imagine how much money you would have. It would be a lot. <clears throat> Millions. Millions. But the problem is you would have had to pay tax on all of those millions. So on the other hand, let's say you had $100,000 in your Roth IRA back in 2009 and you put it all into Apple stock. That's what this little gold. So this is this is the Roth IRA type of account. I I use the gold bucket because it's pretty and because it's it's gold and it's small because you can only put so much in here like every year you have a limit you're going to learn what the limit is how much can you contribute to your Roth IRA but inside the Roth IRA that's where you get to do the investing 
And so what's inside of this is the actual investments. And I think inside of this bag, I thought I had something that would come out, but it seems to be stuck. Okay, apparently it's glued in. I didn't know that. But down inside there is a really nice treat. Let's pretend that's Apple stock. And this is your thought experiment. What I want you to think about is the difference between investing in this big blue bucket if you were to bought Apple stock versus this gold tax-free type of account. That's what I want you to think about. I want you to just kind of put yourself in that spot where you are like my friend Adam. We were sitting around uh, back in 2009 looking at Apple thinking that's still pretty high. Man, I could kick myself for not putting all of my Roth IRA into Apple stock. But then I wouldn't be diversified. But, but I would have been rich. Huh. It's a challenging thing, you know. So anyway, that's pretty much today's lesson. So don't forget, uh, tax allocation is this week's secret. Uh, I'm going to get rid of this camera because it's not really doing any good. So that's pretty much it. This week's uh, secret class collaboration. And there is in the, in, in the comments below, or the description rather, you will see this actual post. Uh, I think... I think, well, actually, some of these are not correct because I have you including an outline of the Zoom meeting, and that is not relevant. You do not need to do that, but you do want to watch these videos, um, and you do want to update your financial plan with tax allocation. Uh, so you've done asset allocation. Now here's tax allocation. I'm going to give you the answer right up front. Um, so we... Remember, we pretended that you're 10 years older. We pretended that you had a job uh, that is the job you hope for when you uh, actually graduate. So now we're talking about tax allocation, and I want to just kind of give you the answer to the quiz on your capstone. You need to have at least 50 grand in each of these types of accounts. So you got three types of accounts. The taxable asset, that's the big blue bucket. So which one is that? Taxable asset. Remember, if you invest in this big blue bucket, if you invested in Apple stock and you sold it, you have to pay tax on it. So it's taxable. So you're going to pretend you have an, an account in your plan with at least $50,000 that is taxable. And then you're going to have a tax deferred asset. That's your 401k. So here's a little secret answer to the question. If you haven't already done so, you need to set up in your financial plan and write capital. You need to set up a savings goal of contributing to your 401k. But then you have to go over to your profile and you need to add, actually add an account and put some money in it and allocate it allocate it, asset allocate it, uh, and that needs to be at least 50 grand. Now, if you are investing as an aggressive investor and you pretend that you've been investing for 10 years in your 401k and you come up with a different number besides 50 grand, good for you. That's what I want you to do. I want you to play around with that and learn and think. Again, thinking is a really important part of this process. So do that. Do think about it. Uh, but do make sure you have these three buckets filled in your financial plan because it's important that you do that. The next one is the tax-free asset, which is, again, the 401k. I mean, excuse me, the Roth IRA. So you're going to you're going to have an opportunity to be funding your Roth IRA. The question is, are you going to start doing that when you start working? You can. And you're going to learn this week what are the limitations, what are the, what's the contribution limit on a Roth IRA. And you're going to have to learn that. You're going to have a quiz. So that's, those, that's tax allocation, and that's kind of the answer to the question. That, that's really your capstone assignment. The tax allocation part of your capstone assignment, those three accounts, those three amounts, your portfolio, it shows tax allocation. So that's kind of the end game of this week's lesson. I want you to learn about different types of accounts.
That's what I want you to learn. And then I want you to do something with it. I want you to go and update your plan as if you're actually investing in a tax uh, advantaged way, taking advantage of your 401k uh, and your Roth IRA. So again, I know you don't have the money, most of you don't have the money to invest in a Roth IRA. That's why we're pretending that you're 10 years older and that you've been working for 10 years at the company where it is your dream job. So this is all part of the planning process. Hopefully that makes sense. If you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comments. If you're watching on YouTube, I always read your comments. If you really need an answer and you're in the course, you know what to do. Hit up GroupMe. Uh, and if GroupMe, is, if GroupMe isn't giving you the answers you need, you're welcome to reach out to me. And before I let you go... In addition to group me as a resource to get your questions answered, as we move forward to the end of the course, which we are doing quickly to the end of the semester, I want you to be successful in your, uh, in your capstone assignment. So let me just remind you, if you're, if you're needing help on your capstone assignment, feel free to uh, shoot me an email with the things that I need in the capstone tutorial email from you. I want you to send me some screenshots, show me exactly what you're working on uh, so I can help you. I'm going to jump into your financial plan, but I want you to send me screenshots of whatever your issue is, what, whatever your specific question is. I want to see screenshots. I want to know what you did to try to figure it out on your own. Okay, don't just send me a tutorial request because you don't know and you haven't spent any time trying to figure it out. I want you to tell me what have you tried and, and I want you to shoot it to the group me first to see if you can get your questions answered um, and then make sure you give me permission uh, to share because when I do the tutorial, I'm going to use your plan and I'm going to basically screenshot or screen share your plan. So that's how that's going to work. So that's it for this week. Uh, again, if you have questions, I'm going to update. I'm going to go check in Canvas and make sure that your assignment does not include that outline. Because if you are watching this, which you're supposed to be watching this, if you see the uh, instructions say outline the Zoom meeting, you don't have to do that. That's a lot of work. So I will do that myself and I'll put it in this post uh, with this video. So again, the link to this post is in the description. You might want to check it out because I always update it after the live stream with additional information like timestamps. So that will help you. And again, it will be in the description on YouTube on our YouTube playlist, which is right there. So that's it for now. Uh, thanks for joining us. If you're online, YouTube, Facebook, hit the like button, subscribe to the channel. It's my new personal channel. And I have like 20, no, I think I have 92 subscribers. I'm big time now. 92 subscribers. I think you need a thousand before you can actually do an ad. I don't want to do any ads, but I would appreciate my friends. If you want to be reminded when I do a video, you got to subscribe and hit the little bell and all that. So thanks for doing that. Okay, that's it. I don't see any questions, so I'm going to hit the end button. But first, I'm going to finish the broadcast. I'm going to hit the end button now. Have a great